Okay, we are going to now go through the homework and uh, the how to study lesson on how to study prophecy. Um, we are going to kind of quickly go over the homework. It's kind of a, I kind of asked you a lot of questions. So this is going to be fast and not super detailed, but I just want to go over it. So uh, this is the beginning of the different questions. We kind of made a little scenario. There's kind of a amillennial guy or a postmillennial guy who are kind of saying, you know, taught, you're talking to at a Christian booksellers convention and they each have their own view. And so you're going to study Revelation 20 to try and figure out, you know, if it's literal, there's a literal thousand years or not. How many times is the word thousand repeated in Revelation 21 through 7? Answers, six times. How many times does a thousand appear? Three times. And the thousand appear? Three times. What is the difference between the two and why does it matter? A thousand year means of the same essence and nature as a thousand. And the thousand means a specific thousand. Both are significant and argue for a literal meaning. So if you look at any Greek grammar, when it doesn't have a the in front of it, and here's a big word, sorry about it, it's called anarthris, that is it doesn't have the article or the in front of it. Um, when it doesn't have it, it's speaking of essence and nature, but when it has a the, it means a specific one. Now, there's three of each, which kind of nails it down. It's like John chapter 1, um, verses 1 through 3, where it uses um, Jesus, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word, you know, goes in there, it uses both the article and not the article to emphasize that Jesus is of the same essence and nature as God, and he is specifically um, the Word of God. What would be the purpose of using thousand over and over again if it doesn't mean a thousand? If you didn't mean a thousand, a literal thousand, you would probably say for after a long time or when much time has passed or after many ages, etc. Read a Revelation 20, 1 through 10. Would you say the language being used is vague, nebulous, and general or specific, exact, and detailed? Specific. How is Satan described in Revelation 20, 1 through 3? Dragon, serpent of old, devil, and Satan. Who binds Satan? An angel. Where is Satan cast? The abyss. Is John referring to a literal chain? Yes. They have literal chains in the spiritual world, just like they have literal horses and robes and trees. It is not a chain from our world, but a real chain nonetheless, just because it appears. Angels are spiritual beings, but they're still real. God is a spirit being, but he's still real, more real than our temporary world, which is passing away. How can a spiritual being be bound with the chain? Spiritual beings have substance. and They are not of this world or reality. The spiritual realm is not absent of persons and things. What happens to the place where Satan is bound? It is shut up and sealed. What is the effect of Satan being bound? He can't deceive the nations any longer. If Christ is ruling now, in his kingdom, is Satan bound and unable to deceive the nations? Well, if you look at all those verses, Satan and his demons are still wandering about deceiving people from nations all over the world. So it doesn't seem like he's bound. Revelation 20, verse 4, what fur furniture items did John see in verse 4? Were these literal? Thrones. Yes, they are literal. Who sat on these pieces of furniture in verse 4? Were these people literal? Believers in general? Martyrs in specific? Some scriptures there. It is literal. How did these those people die? Is this literal? They were martyred for the faith, and it is literal. At the end of the thousand years, what happens to the, these people, and why do they, and what do they do? Uh, well, it's literal. They rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. They actually rule and reign with Christ, just like it says. Look at Revelation 21 through 7. Are there any general references to numbers 
of things used in this text, not including the word a thousand. Verse three, short time. Verse eight, number of them like the sand of a seashore. Verse 10, day and night forever and ever. So yes, there are nonspecific terms used for um, general lengths of time, short or long. Does John use general references in any other part of the book of Revelation? Yes, many waters, many angels and myriads of angels and thousands of thousands and great multitude and many horses and many people, tongues and nations and kings and many waters and many waters and great multitudes and many waters and diadems. Oh, yes, yes. It just, um, there's many times when he doesn't want to be specific, he uses a general term. If John frequently used general references to describe large unspecified numbers of things, and if they occur all throughout the book, why does he use a specific number six times in Revelation 21 through 7 to describe the duration of the reign of Christ? Because it's a literal thousand years. <laughs> Look at the use of specific numbers in the book of Revelation. See if they are used to literally number things or if they are only general approximations of the numbers of things. Yes, they're all literal. The last point, I, in any of these uses, does a specific number not denote a specific number of things? No. If the book of Revelation usually uses specific numbers to denote actual numbers of things, why not take the word thousand literally? There is no reason not to take it literally. Some have argued that the thousand years is figurative because of the cross references and the way thousand is used in other places in the Bible. So we're going to look at these cross-references. Remember what we've learned so far about context and cross-references and what part of interpretation carries the most weight. It's always the near context, <clears throat> and then a little bit farther context, and then context within a major section of the book, context within the book, context within books written by the same author, context within the Testament, context like that. You grow out, but most of the weight is a near context. So, Psalm 50, verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, obviously that's not literal. God is saying he owns everything. He owns the world, right? Okay, so God does literally own every beast on uh, of the field and the cattle on a thousand hills, but the expression means he owns all beasts everywhere. And so, you say, okay, so why would we take this text written by, you know, David, the psalmist, to a different audience at a different time, in a different context, and take this meaning and freight it into something written much, much, much later to a different audience in a different context? See, that is misusing cross-reference. Psalm 90 verse 4, For a thousand years in your sight are like a yesterday when it passes, or as a watch in a night. The purpose here, all it's saying, is a literal thousand years of time is like a literal watch in the night to God, since God is eternal and never grows old or never gets tired of waiting because he exists at all times simultaneously, since he is eternal. So, even if you wait a thousand years, it's like a literal day, and a literal day is like a thousand years. It doesn't affect any God because he is an eternal being. Second Peter 3.8, which references or alludes to Psalm 90 verse 4, uh, but do not let these this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The words like tell us that an expressed comparison is being made or a simile. Peter is merely saying that a literal thousand years is like a single day to God, but the point is that God doesn't grow old or tired or get impatient because he's eternal. Are the verses above conclusive that all uses of thousands should be taken figuratively? Absolutely not. If a specific book of the Bible is being studied and it uses numbers literally, and yet there are a few references in other books of the Bible written by different authors that use numbers figuratively, how should we interpret numbers in the book being studied and why? Well, we always go by how the author uses them, how they're used in the near context and throughout that book. That's where we put our most interpretive weight. 
You interpret a first word or phrase according to the near context, then according to the far context, then according to the context within the particular book, then next context in all the books written by the same author, then the testament in which the word appears, then finally how a word and its synonyms are used in the whole Bible. The farther you get from the near context, the less weight cross-references and meanings of words in different contexts have. So you don't take what is clear in the near context and override it with what some, some other author happened to say in some other place to some other group for some other reason with a different theme and a different purpose. No, you stick with the near context. So now that you have studied harder, what is your interpretation of the six references to a thousand years in Revelation 20? I hope you came to the conclusion it means a literal thousand years. Uh, then I had you read and meditate on Jeremiah 9, verses 23 to 24, write a, write a study title and outline for these verses. Now, I didn't create an outline here. I didn't do a diagram for you and make it all color-coded so it was really easy to see. But hopefully you were able to go to that verse. It's a pretty simple one, and we're going to look at it in a second. We'll look at it in Lagos so we can kind of see it. But I want you to just see what I came up with, and then you compare that with what you came up with, okay? So I, I'm calling this one the art of godly boasting. You know, if I wanted to make it more personal, um, <laughs> uh, the art of how you can boast in a godly way. Now, notice I put you in there. You can boast in a godly way. It's, it's specific. It's direct. It's personal, not abstract. This is a more abstract title. Three reasons you shouldn't boast. Don't boast in your wisdom. Don't boast in your might. Notice how you, yours in each of those. And also there's a command, don't, which also implies second person. It's personal. Don't boast in your riches. So you have three things not to boast in. And then secondly, our second point, one reason you should boast, because the Lord, he delights to exercise loving kindness, the Lord delights to exercise justice, and the Lord delights to exercise righteousness. Okay, so if we look at the text, let's just zing over here, and uh, we could put three reasons um, you should boast. I did one because they're all about because the Lord. These are just different ways um, that the one reason expresses itself. We'll see this. So look at Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. And so after you study the Bible carefully and exactly, um, at least for me, I kind of see texts now broken down and I notice what is the main part and what's emphasizing the main part. So notice, thus says the Lord, the Lord is the one speaking. And he says, first, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. That's where we got, don't boast in your wisdom right there. Secondly, and secondly, let not the mighty man boast of his might. That's where we got, don't boast in your might. Third, let not the rich man boast of his riches, which is where we got, don't boast in your riches. Right from the text, right? But, in contrast, let him who boasts boast of this that he understands and knows me. This is the main one reason. This one reason, knowing God, is contrasted with these three things not to boast in. Don't boast in these things. Boast that you know me. That is the one reason you should boast, because you know the Lord. And then these three phrases that follow tell us about the Lord. They're not additional reasons um, to boast in things. They are more information about the Lord. So we're told the one thing to boast in, knowing God, and we are told who the Lord is in three phrases. I am the Lord who, one, exercising, exercises loving kindness. That's where we got this from right here. I am the one who exercises justice. That's where we got this one. The Lord delights to exercise justice. And he is the Lord who delights in exercising righteousness on the earth. 
And notice, I delight in these things, which is why I put the Lord delights, the Lord delights, the Lord delights, because he delights in these things. So the one reason you should boast is the Lord, and the Lord is the one who delights in these three things. Do you see how I took that exactly from the text? It comes right from the text. My outline is submitting to the inspired structure and grammar of the text. If you're going to be an expository preacher, you have to to be able to do this. You don't have to do the diagram and all the colors. That's not important, but you got to make sure you get the text right. Otherwise, you're not handling accurately or with precision the word of truth. So that's what you're after. Okay, we're going to stop here. I will usually have the homework kind of at the beginning of the next lesson which is going to be on how to study Proverbs. But because the homework was long, I'm going to just cut it off here and just use this as kind of a separate video. So you need to go to video number 12, which is lesson number eight in how to study Proverbs. If you want to learn how to do that, hopefully we will see you there. DrivenNails.com is a user-supported ministry.